Hello, um, <clears throat> I'm Canadian, so I'm not good at yelling. <laughs> so if you can't hear me in the back, you know, wave, throw things. Uh, no garments. Um, how do I, I guess, I guess I advance with this, yes. Uh, better one than this, because this one sucks completely. Uh, so this talk, I, I've been here for the whole meeting, and uh, no, it's as bad. Um, and this talk is not going to be like any of the other talks I've seen. Um, I'm an experimental evolutionary biologist, uh, and uh, worse than that, everything that I really have worked on over the decades has been derived from mathematical theory. So I don't really believe in stories. I don't really believe in, you know, nice images. I like data. I like math. <clears throat> what can I say? Um, and a big problem facing all of you is that uh, dating back to the 1960s, storytelling has predominated. And uh, this is going to be all science. Uh, I've hidden most of the math uh, in preparing this talk with Grant Rutledge, who really should be giving this talk, but he's jet lagged out of his brain from a trip to Japan. Uh, we decided to eliminate all the math. But we do have sort of cartoony math. Um, and I will try to cartoon my way uh, through the math for you. But then we're going to get into gigantic experimental uh, studies with lots of data, and not on people, but on fruit flies. And that is because at the core of what your society is based on are some very deep scientific issues, which have not been systematically addressed using strong inference science, in my opinion, to date, ever. And this is a follow-on to Grant's preliminary presentation of these kinds of results, I think, two years ago to four or five people. Uh, so we have more data and uh, more firm conclusions about the relationship between paleo ideas, organic agricultural ideas, and that's what I'm trying to accomplish. So to go into a little more detail than, than Brett did, um, a traditional uh, evolutionary, evolutionary point of view, which tends to dominate uh, pop thinking about evolution, we can actually blame on Charles Darwin. And that's the idea that evolution proceeds with great gradualness over long periods of time, like hundreds of thousands to millions of years. And in that context, uh, it's a natural conclusion to infer that our best possible diet is the one we had for at least a million years prior to the advent of agriculture, which is to say a paleo hunter-gatherer regime uh, beautifully embodied in this image here. Uh, <clears throat> though probably we didn't really look like that. Uh, so that I think is the intuitive basis for a lot of what many people who come to these meetings believe. To be very concrete, I believed that view myself in the 1970s. Uh, before I started to look at data from experimental evolution studies, I bought into the then conventional wisdom of Darwinism that indeed evolution proceeded very slowly and we probably weren't very adapted to agricultural diets or lifestyles. But starting in 1980, we got a revolution in evolutionary biology which most people outside of the field have not heard about, which is that evolution can actually act with great speed. And I was one of the people behind that revolution it gave rise to a field called experimental evolution. And I have a book called that with a co-author and many contributors. And according to this uh, body of thinking and a large amount of data, much of which I published, in fact, we should be well adapted to the use of organic agricultural foods. That means diets from before 1850 um, because at least Eurasian populations have had those for thousands of years. And that's hundreds of generations. And we've shown in the lab with flies that you can accomplish amazing things in about 100 generations, sometimes less than that, sometimes 40 generations. That's the basis for Marlene Zuck's critique of 
many of your beliefs in her book, Paleo Fantasy. And she points to some examples of this from research in evolutionary biology, including a famous human example, which is the adaptation of Tibetan populations to high altitudes. So to this point in time, we're really dealing with verbal contentions. And uh, starting in uh, 2010, my lab and colleagues there, uh, principally Grant Rutledge, whose data I'm going to be showing today, have developed a mathematically based alternative to both sides on this debate. And starting with Grant Rutledge's doctoral research, we have done experiments to test these core ideas. And at the core is how fast can populations adapt to a recent but not entirely novel diet, that is to say, like the Neolithic transition of agriculture. Um, now, at the foundation of our reasoning is this very profound result, which is not uh, intuitive gestalt. It's hardcore math derived from basic first principles of evolutionary theory. And uh, this result has a name, Hamilton's forces of natural selection. This is the force of natural selection acting on your ability to survive. And what the math shows, which is here sketched, is that before the first age of reproduction, little b, uh, the force of natural selection is phenomenally strong. And much of our intuition about what natural selection can do is derived from uh, the results you get when natural selection is very strong. But uh, once reproduction starts in a population, the math shows that the force steadily falls until sometime around the last age of reproduction in a population when it hits zero. Some people think that aging should start here, but actually the theory suggests it should start sometime after the start of reproduction in a population. That doesn't mean when you first had fun in high school, or I hope not junior high. Um, it means what goes on in a population and how it subsequently evolves. Now, I have made my living off of this equation since 1976. And what I was the first to show very clearly in the 1970s is that if you change the timing of the force of natural selection, if you change when reproduction starts, you can make aging evolve. In other words, the master control of aging is not the damn telomeres. It's not the free radicals. It's the force of natural selection. If natural selection pays attention to the problem, it can do anything it wants with aging, including producing immortal non-aging organisms, which it does frequently. Here's the basic idea. Your normal lab culture regime for fruit flies and many other organisms, including mice, is to start the next generation almost as soon as you have adults and produce the next generation and discard the adults. This is what I used to call trailer park trash reproduction. Uh, until I sort of got a little more woke and uh, a little more sympathetic to the plight of the American working classes. But that's just an arbitrary thing you can do in a lab. You can actually change when reproduction occurs. And here we have, under the heading delayed breeding regime C in green, the uh, typical med school, graduate school reproductive pattern, which does include sex, uh, all the way through undergraduate years, graduate school, postdoc, tenure track, in the case of the academic version, or for the medical school, your undergraduate degree, medical school, internship, residency, getting your feet in underneath you in your first practice, and then finally you reproduce in your, your late 30s. And it doesn't really matter that much whether you're male or female. That's the only sane way to approach graduate education, is putting off your reproduction. So the, the math that I just cartooned for you implies that given a reasonable amount of evolutionary time, in these organisms, aging should start soon, and in these organisms, aging should only start later. Okay, Because you're delaying the first time of reproduction. And we've since done this experiment many times, as have others, since the late 1970s. And here is the aging pattern of the A-type flies versus the C-type flies. This is the logarithmic 
uh, logarithm of the mortality rate. So the higher the data go, uh, the more likely an organism is to die. These are data from 20 cohorts of thousands of flies each. It's about a 100,000 fly experiment. Um, and what you see here, which is the normal aging pattern on, this, this, this completely sucks. Okay, what you see over here in the purplish color, which is the A trailer park crash reproduction cycle, is boom, aging is taking off from about 14 days of age in the fruit fly life cycle. Uh, in the med school lifestyle, aging doesn't even start until uh, after about 30 days of age. In those particular flies, they don't get to reproduce until they're at least 26 days of age. However, all through this period, they produce eggs. The start of aging is not the start of life. The start of aging is not even the start of reproduction and physiologically. The start of aging is defined by the decline in the forces of natural selection because aging is nothing other than the decline in age-specific adaptation because natural selection is giving up on us quantitatively and progressively. Now, a whole other body of research is the fact that aging stops at late ages, which is full of radical promise, and someday I may come back to this meeting and explain about aging stopping and what you might do about that, but I don't have time today. Uh, what I'm really showing you here is the power of experimental evolution over a small number of generations to completely retune the aging pattern, which sort of makes it look like, hey, we should all be well adapted to agriculture. Instead, uh, what I'm now going to summarize is some math we did to investigate what happens in a population when an environment or a nutritional regime changes. And that is, it's a mathematical corollary of the cartoon I showed you that at early ages, populations adapt very fast to a change in an environmental selection regime. This is a completely general mathematical result. Um, but at later ages, adaptation responds slower because the, at those ages, the force of natural selection is weaker. That's why we have aging, but it's also why, as you will see, you're right, sort of. That means as natural selection will rapidly improve adaptation to a new environment or new lifestyle at younger ages, but at later ages, it won't. So that was an intuition I had in uh, 2010. We did the math on that from 2010 to about 2012. Not showing you any of that. And then Grant started his PhD in 2012. And we thought, let's look at age-dependent patterns of adaptation to three different diets. Because unbeknownst to us, we'd done a Neolithic revolution in our lab. I'm going to just explain that quickly. Um, I'm going to be talking about my A fast reproducing populations at the first part of, for most of this talk. And now I have to go into the diet history of our flies. You have to pay careful attention to this part. So we got our flies from uh, the backyard of uh, behind a barn in an apple orchard in Massachusetts. And the northeastern Drosophila melanogaster populations of the United States have been evolving there since the 1600s, living off of chiefly rotten apples. Drosophila melanogaster, the fruit flies I use, don't feed off fresh fruit, they only feed off rotting fruit. Um, and there's some of their maggots coming out of an apple. That is their ancestral diet, their long ancestral diet. But we brought them into the lab in the 1970s and soon put them on, in 1981, a banana-based diet, banana and molasses. And the flies I'm first going to show you have been on that diet for more than 1,000 generations. In human terms, that's like 20 to 30,000 years of absolutely rigid adherence to a brand new diet. And that's plenty of time to adapt these populations to this new diet. Starting uh, around 10 years ago, we experimented with an entirely novel diet based on orange, replacing banana. So what we have here are three kinds of diets, a long ancestral fly paleo diet, 
a long-standing but still evolutionarily relatively recent banana diet, think Neolithic Revolution for our flies, and here we have a completely novel diet that we know for sure our flies have never been adapted to, which is orange. Um, and I'm going to take you through data on flies on these three diets, okay? The data I'm going to show you is all going to be about our best measure of instantaneous function, which is the capacity of a fruit fly to survive uh, over a one-day period, which is this, yeah, that's just like useless, this px parameter, age-specific survival probability from age x to x plus 1. mx in females is the number of eggs they lay between age x and x plus 1, denominated in days. The product of those two things, px, mx, which does actually appear in the equations in my field, is a compound measure of your ability to survive and do something useful to a Darwinian, which is reproduce. So this is like not only the fact that you are 62 years old at a cocktail party, but you might meet somebody new and exciting and do something about it. That's px times mx. So at every adult age x, we have this compound measure of the ability to survive and reproduce, or in human terms, perhaps, survive and contribute to science or some other field of endeavor. So here are the core predictions that come out of the math uh, for three different diets. The entirely novel diet is in orange and dotted. The evolutionarily recent or analog agriculture Neolithic diet is in blue. And the long abandoned diet, fly paleo diet, is dashed and red. And our prediction is that at early ages, the uh, dietary regime where the flies will do best will be the blue diet, the evolutionarily recent one, which remember is banana. Blue means banana in these data. Our entirely novel diet is in orange, it's oranges. And our fly paleo diet is in red, it's the apple diet. And what this is showing is strong early adaptation in the uh, banana diet. Of course, no adaptation at all to the, the orange diet, but at later ages, they converge because the adaptation to banana didn't reach the later ages. At later ages, the long abandoned fly paleo apple diet is the best diet according to the theory. What do we actually see? Okay, that's the question. So to make this a little more concrete, in A-type fast reproducing flies, we have uh, a total of six cohorts we study, uh, well, six for each diet, six on banana, six on orange. Uh, 12,000 individuals were studied, a million eggs were counted. And here's the predicted result just on the evolutionarily recent diet, banana, like organic agricultural diet versus orange. Think high fructose corn syrup, seed oils, all the nasty stuff none of us should be eating, Twinkies. The idea is that at early ages, the organic agricultural diet will be clearly superior, but at much later ages, they should converge because we're not fully adapted to the banana diet at every age. And here are the results. Um, so what you see here is that all through these early adult ages, the flies do better on the banana diet than they do on the orange diet. But at later ages, in fact, the data converge. And at later ages, you can eat your Twinkies just as well as you can eat your whole wheat cereal, okay? You're not adapted to either one at later ages. All right? Then the question is, what will happen with the long abandoned fly paleo apple diet versus our banana diet, which has been our standard diet for a thousand generations? Here the amount of data is even greater. We have 36,000 individuals, more than four million eggs counted. This is our prediction that at early ages, the banana will do as well or slightly better on the, uh, the fly will do better on the banana or as well on the banana as the apple. But at later ages, where we're saying adaptation hasn't penetrated yet, the flies will do better on the apple diet. And again, we're measuring our instantaneous health measure, px times mx, and here's the result. The result is basically at early ages, 
It doesn't really matter that much whether you eat the banana or, or the apple diet if you're a fly, but at later ages it starts to matter more and more. Now let me just explain why this is a very conservative test. It's a very conservative test because we're doing a completely half-assed emulation of the fly paleo diet. Because, you know, we are synthetically creating a rotten apple medium out of cultured yeast and organic Trader Joe's applesauce. The actual flies would have had a more complex diet. They would have been eating partly off rotten other fruit and vegetable stuff in their environment. And they would have had a very different lifestyle. The banana diet is the exact emulation of what they've had for a thousand generations. So, so this is their real version of the organic agricultural diet. So what I'm saying here is, this is a total lame ass fly paleo emulation. Yet you still get the clear superiority on this lame ass emulation. So yeah, maybe you're just eating grass fed beef and grass fed lamb and wild caught salmon and you're not eating the wide spectrum of animal derived foods that we consume through a million years or more primarily in Africa. But even a lame ass emulation of a paleo diet <laughs> still shows a significant benefit later in life. Now one critique of this experiment which we've already seen in manuscript reviews is well this is because of some weird feature of the biochemistry of apples. To which we say bull because we have a critical experiment that shows it's not just the apple, it's actually the relationship between the force of natural selection. Because if you change when the forces of natural selection crash, that is to say when we expect <coughs> aging to stop, you also change the timing of when natural selection is strong and therefore the timing of when you need to make a switch from organic agricultural foods to paleo foods. So all the data I showed you to this point was on the A-type flies, early reproducers. We also have diet transition data from our C-type flies, which are late reproducers which are frankly not analogous to what human populations do, because we love to reproduce early and often. Um, <clears throat> but it tests the principle that it's not just the effing apple, it's actually the interaction between what the forces of natural selection are doing relative to a new environment. So there are the C-type flies we're switching to, different system. And this different system, we're switching from the result at the top, the A-type flies, where uh, you predict only an early advantage or good performance from the fly version of the agricultural diet. In the C-type flies, where natural selection is stretching out over many more ages deeper into the adult lifespan, the theory predicts that you'll have a prolonged period of superiority on the banana, which is what these flies evolved in. And the transition to the fly paleo diet will not be beneficial until much later. Do you get that? Because I know this is complicated. I'm switching from the top uh, prediction to the bottom prediction. Because I'm using not the A flies, which are in the top, but the C flies, which are in the bottom. Okay? And this has all been done with like real math. Uh, this is the cartoon version of it. And here are the results. If you are sustained on the banana medium and you reproduce much later, but only on banana medium, you sustain a Im functional improvement on the banana medium. If humans had not reproduced until the age of 40, 45, or 50, all through the last 10,000 years, while we're living on agricultural foods, everybody in this room would do fantastically well on an organic agricultural diet. Only very, very late do you see the switch over to a slight benefit on the apple. But it's still, you know, your choice. Clearly, nonetheless, your biggest benefits at earlier ages on the banana. So what does this all mean? What this all means is if you revert to your long abandoned ancestral diet at later ages, you'll get a health benefit. So our prediction is that 10-year-old children will not derive much of a paleo benefit. Okay? But there aren't a lot of 10-year-olds here. So 
What, we're, what this research implies is organic agricultural diet into your 30s, great. You'll probably have a transition zone where it doesn't make a lot of difference. When you're my age, I'm in my 60s, you should be on a paleo type diet, even if it's only a half-assed emulation based on stuff you can buy at Trader Joe's or Whole Foods. <laughs> and yes, that is indeed what I do. Thank you very much. Uh, we have about 10 minutes of questions, I think. Um, the uh, PXMX prediction curve was very non-monotonic, whereas your resulting data, were, well, it was all over the place, but you, you drew the line in the middle, which was straight. So it's counterintuitive to me that it would be non-monotonic. Why is it like that? Uh, the actual math is, is more like the data. Th those are just lame figures that are cartoons that we drew to try to communicate. The actual math derived figures are, are more like the data. Uh, the data look the way they do because those lines are actually fit by uh, maximum likelihood procedures. On your final conclusion that you could switch diets in later age and get the benefit, um, that's actually not shown in the experiments that you did where you kept the flies on the diet throughout their entire life, you didn't Correct. do a switching at some point in their age. So how do you know there couldn't be some early on effect that's cumulative that you right. can't get rid of later? Wouldn't you have to do the experiment where you actually switch them? And we have done that experiment. And it supports the same result? Uh, we, we've done a variety of different experiments involving diet switching for decades. Basically in a fly, the switching period is about three days and there's no real historical or longitudinal effect. Um, and uh, my personal experience from making people switch, starting with myself uh, about 10 years ago, um, is that it takes about three years to fully make the transition. Roughly, you can translate a fly day to a human year. So but after about three years, leaving aside, of course, like morphological damage, you can't repair that, but in terms of physiological functioning, the transition in flies is about three days. And from what I've seen in an anecdotal number of cases, and Brett's supposed to do this for real, because uh, this is like an introduction to his, his doctoral research, um, three years is an order of magnitude answer there. Does your model provide any clues for how to extend lifespan even beyond the apple diet? by other techniques. Yeah, so we have, we have a paper on that as well. We have a paper that combines diet with supplementation and uh, with some very interesting results that either Grant or I will present in the next year or two, probably at this meeting. Thank you. Hi. Uh, my question uh, relates to the degree of change in the diet. Whether the degree of change affects the time that it takes to adapt. Mm -hmm. So you have uh, apples and you have bananas. Uh, okay, the apples are rotten, so I don't know what, you know, in terms of uh, macronutrients. All, all, all three of these regimes synthetically emulate rot. So okay. all three of these regimes are supplied with yeast cultures, which is uh, pretty optimal for fly nutrition. Okay, but the change in the Neolithic was more from a protein-fat-based mm -hmm. diet sure. to a carbohydrate diet. Yeah, so yeah, I agree. So maybe the adaptation would have taken longer. Yeah, but uh, at early ages when the force of natural selection is strong, probably not a problem. Um, I, I don't think many experimental evolutionists would disagree with what I just said. But your point is well taken. Uh, last year or the year before, we had a presentation of a graduate student who did 40 years worth of, of uh, fruit fly generations and changing their diet, all right? And I then- think, I think that the, was Grant Rutledge. Huh? I think that was my co-author on this talk. Is it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. All right, here's, yeah. here's what he added, yeah. is that at the end, 
they gave them the choice of which diet they wanted to use, uh -huh. and they all went back to the original diet. You mean the apple? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So so even though. 40 gen or 40 years where the generations had never seen that Right, diet. so, so that, your question brings up a very important point, which is that what we did with the flies is far more stringent than the agricultural revolution. Because humans throughout the whole agricultural period, even if they're supposed to be farmers and eat the damn bread and everything else, always cheat. If they can get their hands on animal foods, they go for it big, big time, right? Um, likewise, fresh fruit and other things that we've eaten for millions of years. So yeah, humans, like the flies, really want, they've so, have so many thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of generations of adaptation to their paleo analog diet. That's what they want. That's what they like. We also had another presentation of a professor, I think he's UCLA, who studied that at age 40, in order to live longer, you have to convert to paleo. That was his cutoff. Yeah, uh, I will say that the formal prediction would depend on your ancestry. Uh, the more recent your, I mean, uh, the extreme case is, of course, Australasian Aboriginal populations which have no adaptation to agriculture. And for them, um, th there is no age where that's a good choice. They're always better off. And the work of Stefan Lindbergh has, I think, shown that pretty dramatically. Um, but the standard view of evolutionary biologists before 1980 would have been that that's true of all of us because there hasn't been enough time. Since 1980, evolutionary biologists have switched on that particular point. And our view is that at early ages, um, if you do something for a few thousand years, you'll be pretty well adapted to it at early ages. Thank you. Uh, yeah, maybe you, you could oh. speak a word. We, uh, can you, can you yeah. say a word about the, the basic theory of aging that you hold vis-a-vis uh, -vis the mainstream uh, gerontology community, um, that aging is not like a, akin to a rusting process, and then how this and uh, the, what you call the Hamiltonian lifestyle uh, interventions can give rise to that four-step process by which you, you hope that we can crush aging the same way we've crushed cr uh, infectious disease. Wow, that, that, that's a lot for me to, to, to address. Or, or can you just talk right. about the theory so, of so, aging? So the first, first point is first point first. Uh, so we've actually analyzed the genomics uh, and transcriptomics of the A and C type populations. And they differ at hundreds of sites across the genome affecting hundreds of downstream physiological pathways. There are not seven effing deadly whatevers behind aging. There are hundreds of features of the metabolism that have to be retuned to live substantially or radically longer. So the whole reductionist paradigm of, you know, you take this supplement and this supplement and this supplement, or we inject you with uh, turned on telomerase Real data don't show that. Data where you can actually put all those hypotheses to the test. Aging is underlain by almost as much complexity as adaptation itself, and of course all the functional genes in your genome underlay, underlay adaptation, a subset of which degrade in their value to you as a function of age, not because of somatic mutation, but because of evolutionary detuning because the force of natural selection is so weak, it's like Rhett Butler at the end of Gone with the Wind where he doesn't give a damn about Scarlett O'Hara anymore, and you're Scarlett O'Hara, okay? Now the second point is, um, I have been publishing articles on how to uh, postpone or indeed eliminate human aging since 1984. Um, and I have a website on this called 55theses.org or .com. Um, you can find it by going Michael Rose Aging, and if you see something with the numerals 55, you've got to that website. Um, more recently, we also published an article called Four Steps to the Control of Aging. Um, I think by the end of this century, we will have aging as under control as we have infectious disease. We should say by the end of this century, I believe that people will be routinely living for hundreds of years. And of course, I'm all about the details of how you get there. Uh, I'm not a glamorous prophet like Aubrey de Grey. 
I'm just uh, an evolutionary geneticist who does math and large-scale experiments. Um, but, but go to the articles or websites. If you Google Michael Rose aging, uh, you'll see lots of stuff on that.